Several years ago, uh, one of my friends gave me a poem which I like very much. Someday this life will end, and lest some whim should prompt you to review it, let her who knows the story best tell you the quickest way to do it. Say, she was happy. Say, she knew it. Thank you so much. I like to tell all sorts of stories, but ghost stories are among my favorites. Now, I like ghost stories because you do not have to believe in ghosts to enjoy a good ghost story. But a good ghost story makes you wonder, could that really be true? Do you suppose that really did happen? How does Jeffrey make his presence known to you and others? Well, we hear the heavy footsteps clumping down the hall and doors open and slam. And there's a rocking chair in our living room that will just gently sway back and forth, though there's nobody in it. We call it Jeffrey's chair. Was it scary when you first found out there was a ghost in your house? Nobody's ever been afraid of Jeffrey. Just been a delight to have that. Wonder what's going to happen next. But I was sitting in this very chair back in October of 1966, reading, and I heard heavy footsteps going down that hall, and the door to my son Ben's room opened, and it slammed. And I thought maybe Ben had come home from Birmingham Southern, and I called him, and he didn't answer. And I got up to see, and there wasn't anybody in the house. A few days later, Dilsey, who was in junior high school then, I guess, she and I were both out here in this room reading, and I heard those same heavy footsteps again out in the hall. I looked over at Dilsey to see if she was hearing her eyes getting real big. And the cat waked up out of his sound sleep and jumped down out of that rocking chair arched his back and the hair stood up around his neck and just went tearing out of the room as though he were terribly frightened. So we thought maybe we had something and one of the children named him Jeffrey, just the way you name any pet. Did you believe in ghosts before meeting Jeffrey? Now I never have said I believed in ghosts. I've always said they're interesting. Came in one night when I'd been out to a furniture repair class out at the junior community college here. And I was tired and ready to go to bed and started going to my bedroom and I couldn't open the door. My bed had been moved over across the door so that I couldn't get in. And there's only one door to that room and I'm the only one living here now. So I got a little perturbed about it and I hollered at him that night. Usually he, he doesn't do things bad like that. Would you tell me the background about Jeffrey, and was he associated with any past murders, suicides, deaths, etc., that took place in your home before you bought it? Nobody has ever been murdered in my home, nor have we had any suicides. I don't think there was any traumatic event that took place there. I think Jeffrey came to stir up my interest in ghosts. So I almost went on a crusade of collecting these tales. And went into other states, 13 Georgia ghosts, the best known of Georgia's ghost tales, and 13 Tennessee ghosts, and 13 Mississippi ghosts, and then Jeffrey introduces 13 more Southern ghosts. I guess I still think of myself more as a writer than as a storyteller, though I spend a great deal more time telling stories now. Storytelling demands time from the teller and, and energy, and it's a gift. A real, a good story is really a gift, and a gift of love. A lot of stuff in here. First thing, it's our family scrapbook, as I told you. It starts when I'm a baby in arms down in Thomasville, Alabama, my hometown, and it extends all the way through college days. On this page. 
and all these children who came to my birthday party. We used to have plays at school, and the children would pose as various characters from history or famous portraits. And I was the age of innocence, I remember that. And this, I was a, a freshman in college. I, I had a, that suit I had on had a velveteen collar. Remember it very well, and the hat. You, we had to wear hats to town when I went to Huntington as a fresh. Had to wear a hat and gloves when you went to town. I went to Huntington. Real deep depression. In 1935, had a little scholarship from Thomasville High School, and and also. I had an NYA, National Youth Administration. That was one of the early government programs to help people who needed it get an education. And my first assignment was in the science lab, and I, I never had even been in a lab. And I had to help prepare the cats and the frogs to be dissected. It was a kind of rough introduction to the world of science. Pretty rough way to earn your living in college, but it was a great time to go to college because everybody who was there, we were all in the same condition financially. Nobody had much money. But we just had a good time at Huntington then, and we have kept up this class of 39. is the best class that ever graduated from Huntington. I'm quite sure of that. All of the, the smartest and the most fun and the the cleverest and, and the most loving class, I suppose, because we we have kept in touch. And she made me aware that growing up in a small town and being close to the people who lived there gave me a treasury of things to write about. At the time, I was not aware of it because I, I didn't really know anything about Julia Tutwiler until fairly recent years, you know, except the surface trivial things that most people know about her. I think it probably made me conscious of what a truly remarkable woman she was. And it laid the foundation for my being able to write about her as she was and, and not with all these little fancy curly cues and embellishments, but just the plain, simple truth about Julia Tutwell. And for that, I also owe a debt to her. Rhoda Ellison, because she just purely haunts me. I just can't get her out of my system. She, uh, well, she lived at a time when women were not given a great deal of prominence in the life of Al in Alabama, especially in the South. Grew up during slavery times. Her, her father was a very famous educator. If you were anybody, you sent your son to Professor Tutwiler's Green Spring School for Boys. And she grew up at that school and attended the classes with the boys, and studied the same textbooks, and took the same exams, and thought that it was perfectly natural for boys and girls to go to school together, and had a, much of a shock when she tried to enroll Eastern College, and they told her they didn't accept women, only men in their classrooms. And she became aware that the University of Alabama also closed its classrooms to women and launched a crusade to get girls at the university and was successful in that. At that time, she was teaching in Livingston, was the president of the college over there. What is now Livingston University started as a small academy. And she was there almost from the beginning. And nurtured that school along. She provided education for girls who would never have been able to have afforded to go to school had it not been for Miss Julia. She was a woman of much compassion and patience and determination. <laughs> Once she thought she was right, there was no deterring her. Her only rule was do right. She said everybody could understand that. And I think she lived her life doing right. 
And I would, I'd like for her memory to be kept alive. And I, I tried to put her in a book and she wouldn't get in a book. She wanted somebody acting out her life, something alive and in the present. Well, I'm a newspaper reporter by profession. And when I get interested in a story, you have to do a lot of research on it. Be sure you have the names right and the dates and everything spelled correctly. And the events surrounding the occurrence are absolutely accurate. So I use my newspaper background. Here's a picture of me when I was a police reporter for the Alabama Journal in Montgomery about 1940. I was one of the first women police reporters in the South. But on this occasion, I was covering a National Guard encampment and was learning how to defend against bayonet attacks, which I never had to use, but I was doing right well in this photograph. I had done some stringer work during the summer to the, for the Mobile Press Register, the Birmingham News, and Montgomery Advertiser and edited the college newspaper. When it came time for me to graduate from Huntington, all I'd ever wanted to do was to be a newspaper reporter. And I went down a couple of months before graduation to apply at the Montgomery Advertiser to work on their staff. And I remember their city editor, Hartwell Hatton, had his pipe clenched in his teeth, and I was standing by his desk talking to him. And he looked up at me and said, if you were a man, I'd hire you. I've read your stuff and you write well, but I'm not gonna have any women working for my newspaper. And I was so shocked because it had never occurred to me that being a woman was a hindrance in any way to doing what you wanted to do. Growing up thinking I could do, do anything. And to be turned down for the job I wanted just because I was a woman, was just a little more than I could understand. So I went back to Thomasville after I graduated and helped my mother in the insurance office and did some more newspaper writing, some freelancing, until one day the Alabama Journal, which was the afternoon paper of the Montgomery Advertiser. Got a telegram from them saying that uh, their columnist and police reporter, Alan Rankin, was having to join the Air Force and they needed a replacement and could I come? And I could certainly come. And I covered murder trials and finally got promoted, if you would call it that, to covering the Capitol. Frank Dixon was governor then, and he held a press conference every afternoon. And, and there came an opportunity to move to Birmingham, and a little over two years I was with the news. I quit my newspaper career when we moved to Selma, well, when I married. And we moved here and had three children, and I was a wife and mother, and active in all sorts of things. And I always missed being in the newspaper business, though, because being a newspaper reporter, you always knew a little more than most people knew about everything that was going on. You knew some things that never made it into print. And, and it also gave you the liberty of asking people questions that were none of your business. That's amazing in his Navy uniform. Not the way I first saw him. He was in his whites when I first saw him. And that, that white dress uniform is really striking. I was working for the Birmingham News at the time. Amasa had just come back from World War II where he was a lieutenant commander in the Navy. We've got wedding pictures and wedding write-ups. Married in an afternoon ceremony in Thomasville the Methodist Church, and then the honeymoon trip, Birmingham, the old Tutwiler Hotel that's no longer there. Even a picture of the car we traveled in called Bertha Bell, on up to Knoxville and Lexington, 
on into New York, wintertime, snow all over the ground in New York. I never had seen snow like that before. We went up into Connecticut and stayed a while. Then came back after got a job with McGraw-Hill. Came back and settled down in Selma. This is a scrapbook that Amesa made of the family. He started it soon after we married and went forward from there and then went backwards some too. My sister, my oldest sister Edith, I had the first camera that I ever remember, and it was a folding Kodak. And I took many pictures with it. We'd, we'd go take it with us when we'd go to Hill's Pasture, and took pictures around the house of my family and the pets. And, and I liked that idea of preserving on a piece of paper a moment in time and a, a person as they looked just at that time. When I began working with newspapers, I learned how to use a speed graphic. I like to go to country stores and take pictures of the people sitting on the porch. And I like to go way out and photograph old cemeteries and old churches and, and old houses, tenant houses. They're, they're disappearing. You don't see many of them now. And they had such character wouldn't want to live in one, and I don't blame anyone else for not wanting to live in one, but they were a part of the southern landscape that's disappearing. The disappearing south I'd like to preserve as much as I can. Then uh, here we are with uh, Kitty being born. Baby girl Wyndham, born at 3.50 p.m. on December the 17th, weighed seven pounds and five ounces. And the, the whole bill for the Selma Baptist Hospital was $97.50. Just can't quite believe that, but that's our cheap baby. Got her for under $100. And here's a picture of mother and me. Uh, she had come to see her new granddaughter. And I am holding some knitting. I never did any knitting in my life. I don't know who put that in my hand. I guess they thought I was going to get domestic when I had a baby. And then the Mason was a good artist. He loved to decorate things. This thing of Kitty's best friends, I'm going to circle all of them written here. Sketched all sorts of pictures of pretty ladies, and queens, and even borders were just, not just plain. I Amasa was just so talented, he could do anything. More of Kitty. I think we took more pictures of Kitty than we did of the other two, maybe, I'm not sure. Now here comes something still new as added. See, Amasa drew a picture of himself pacing the floor there, waiting for Ben to be born. His little chubby Ben. and Looks like he had just spit up on my shoulder. It looks very wet up there. And Kitty liked her little brother from the very beginning. I remember when we brought him home from the hospital. She was waiting at the top of the stairs. We were in an upstairs apartment at the time and had all of her favorite toys in her arms to hand to her little brother who was just coming home. Then we had another little child, Helen Ann, whom we called Dilsey. She was a sweet, good, beautiful little baby. Everybody loved her. And she won the first prize. Here's Halloween, her first Halloween. She went as uh, the littlest ghost, Ben. My son, the middle child, he's managing editor of the Tuscaloosa News. And my oldest daughter, Kitty, is a psychiatric nurse in Selma. And then my youngest child is director of the Greater Birmingham Convention and Vista's Bureau of Communications. In a serigamy of stories, a collection of tales about growing up in southwest Alabama in the 1920s and 30s, I wrote serigamy so that my grandson, David Wyndham, 
will know something about the family, the large family that he came from. Oh, family. We were all in Birmingham, then investing in Lisa's sister. Ben, barefooted, as always. And we went to Washington one summer. I took the children up there. I mean, we were going in the FBI building, and Ben was barefooted. And they didn't want to let him in because he didn't have on shoes. We didn't even have any shoes with us. And I, I raised such a row about it that they finally let him go in. I tried to make them show me a regulation where it said you had to have on shoes. And this is a Mesa's picture of himself in the hospital. Must have been about the first of his heart ailments. And then let's see, that was about our last Christmas altogether, 1955. Because that next spring, a Mesa died with a massive heart attack here at home. And the scrapbook kind of ends. I was in Birmingham being interviewed on the radio one time, a talk show. And the engineer came in there and said, what are y'all doing to this clock? And we weren't touching. Thomasville, that little town down in southwest Alabama where I grew up, was on the Southern Railroad. A few years ago, the manager of the public radio station over in Tuscaloosa, WUAL, asked if I would do some recollections of growing up Southern and tell a tale or two maybe on that station. He sent some samples up to Washington to National Public Radio and the people who heard them there approved of it and used them on All Things Considered. I think the best awards maybe I have gotten have been from school children who write me notes and say that they have read the books and they're going to write when they get older. And that makes me feel good. Or from teachers who say that I have students in my class who will not read anything. And when I tell them a story or two from your ghost books, it stirs an interest in reading in them, and they will get those books out of the library and struggle to read them. And they're the first books that they've ever shown any interest in trying to read. And if I can encourage anybody to learn to read, because it just opens a whole world of knowledge to you. Just read. Well, I'm a born optimist. I, I get discouraged and I get despondent sometimes at the things I see and hear and get very angry. But I, I still believe in human beings and in the goodness of human beings. And I think if we can all accept that and then accept the, the fact that we are not perfect, and we should not ex expect perfection from others. Uh, God made us all, and if He can love us, we ought to be able to love people most of the time, anyhow. If we can just laugh together, this world's going to be a better place. If someone thinks there is a ghost in their house, what should they do? Enjoy it. That's what we do with Jeffrey. We have a good time with Jeffrey.